Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. This is the first panel of the Michael Batista Lecture Series this year, sponsored by CIRLAC, the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean at York University in Toronto, Canada. I'm Danielle Robinson. I'm the current director of CIRLAC, and we're so glad you're here with us tonight. This lecture series was established by the Friends of Michael Batista and the Royal Bank of Canada to recognize the areas central to That's what happens when you have YouTube on at the same time. My apologies. This lecture series was established by the Friends of Michael Batista and the Royal Bank of Canada to recognize the areas central to his spirit and success, the importance of his Guyanese Caribbean roots, his dedication to and outstanding achievements at RBC, and his unqualified drive and love of learning. We'd also like to acknowledge the additional support we've received from the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies Events Fund, which has enabled us to invite more speakers tonight. And finally, please allow me to introduce you to the moderator and mastermind behind this evening's panel, Dr. Luisa Sotomayor from the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. Uh, good evening and thank you, Danielle, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to reiterate a warm welcome to everyone to the first Michael Baptista Lecture Series event tonight. Uh, so as Danielle said, my name is Luisa Sotomayor and I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. I'm also a fellow at York's, at York's Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and I'm one of the organizers for the event tonight on urban, spatial justice and human security in the Caribbean and Latin America. Uh, this event was organized together with professors Honor Ford Smith, Tamika Samuel Jones, Miguel Gonzalez, and doctoral student Bruno Veras de Moraes, who are the members of the Baptista Series Organizing Committee. Uh, so tonight, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement from the land where I'm located, located currently in Toronto, where uh, York University is. The Toronto is on the dish with one spoon territory, among other treaties. The dish with one spoon is a wampum or an agreement between the Anishinaabeg, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europe Europeans and all newcomers, like myself, have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. To respect this treaty, each person must respect the following tenets as a part of the agreement to be joint caretakers of the land. Only take what you need from the bowl, always leave enough for others, including the bowl itself, keep the dish clean, and do not bring weapons, either sharp objects or harsh words to the ball. As we consider these tenants in our current time, we must be mindful of the struggles that face indigenous peoples across Canada, the Americas and all over the world. These struggles remind us of our own duty to protect, preserve and be grateful for the land on which we live and work. Our panel today asks questions of urban violence, human security, and socio-spatial justice in the Caribbean and Latin America, which are uh, certainly uh, pressing. In embodying the tenets of the one dish, one spoon, one spoon, as now virtual visitors and invited guests or settlers, we invite everyone to consider how our work, uh, our research, and interest in these fields can be impacted by land acknowledgements themselves. We encourage everyone to consider the ways in which the research practice can respond to and respect these important agreements. We have an equal responsibility as caretakers of this land and we recognize the need to live in ways that reflect the treaties agreed to before our time. Our panel tonight on urban spatial justice and human security in the Caribbean and Latin America emerged out of recent discussions at York on the need to look at the changing patterns of urban violence along with the gender, their gendered, transnational, class-based and racial dimensions of uh, urban violence from the perspective of cities and urban development. Uh, another important goal of this session um, has been to put cities in the Caribbean and Latin America into conversation. And we have a, a brilliant panel tonight. We're really fortunate to have um, an amazing group of scholars uh, that are coming from joining us from three different time zones. 
uh, starting with uh, Dr. Eduardo Moncada from Barnard College, then Dr. Um, Alexandra Bello Colec from the London School of Economics, and Dr. Jovan Scott Lewis from University of California, Berkeley, following uh, with Dr. Beverly Mullings from Queen's University, who would be a discussant for tonight's uh, panel. So the first speaker for tonight is Dr. Eduardo Moncada. He's an assistant professor of political science at Barnard College, Columbia University. His research agenda focuses on the political economy of crime and violence, as well as comparative urban politics in Latin America. Eduardo Monta is the author of Cities, Business, and the Politics of Urban Violence in Latin America, the co-editor of Inside Countries, Subnational Research in Comparative Politics, and he has a forthcoming book, uh, which we are all very excited about, Resisting Extortion, Victims, Criminals, and Police in Latin America. Um, so welcome, uh, um, Eduardo, and I would like to pass on the floor now to you. Great. Thank you so much, Luisa. Let me share my screen. All right. And I think everybody can see that. If not, please let me know. Um, so, uh, well, let me start by thanking uh, Professor Sotomayor, uh, Honor Ford Smith, and Danielle Robinson for organizing this wonderful event, Professor Mullings for being our discussant, uh, and the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean at York University for hosting. And it's a pleasure to also be participating alongside Professors Alexandra Abiyokolak and Jovan Scott Lewis. Um, the title of my talk today is uh, Resisting Extortion, Victims, Criminals, and States in Latin America. And this is also the title of my forthcoming, forthcoming book, which I'll uh, be drawing on throughout the conversation of the presentation as part of this um, broader conversation on urban spatial justice and human security. And just to jump into things here, the question I ask in this book is why in settings where the state is unable or unwilling to enforce the rule of law, do victims resist similar forms of criminal victimization in different ways? The project for this book was motivated by an observation early in my field work that, that victims of crimes perpetrated by, by powerful criminal groups can resist their victimization. Not only that, that victims do so in dramatically different ways. And these strategies of resistance differ in terms of whether and how the state is involved, um, the use of different practices of violence by victims, whether the strategies are at the individual or collective level, and more broadly, their implications for local order and politics and governance. So I wanted to understand why victims would resist a similar type of criminal victimization in different ways. And while I don't have time today to go through the entire book, I do wanna draw on some of the findings in the book to make a, a few broader points that I think are relevant, uh, hopefully, to our conversation. Specifically, I wanna propose first that we, we stand to learn a lot about the politics of crime, violence, and insecurity by bringing the victims of those processes more squarely into the center of our analyses. And second, that we can also learn more by broadening the range of potential forms of agency that we normally ascribe to victims in our analyses. And so what I'm gonna do in the, in the time that I have here is just uh, make first make a few comments about some of the relevant existing research on the politics of crime and violence, just to kind of orient ourselves a bit. Then I'll discuss the book's general argument, and then I'm gonna illustrate, really zoom in on part of the argument using the case of resistance to criminal extortion uh, uh, that I study, one of the cases that I study, in this case, uh, informal street vendors in Medellin, Colombia. And I think using the argument to kind of unpack this can help make clear why centering victims and broadening our understanding of their forms of agency can complicate how we think about the politics of crime and violence. And then I'm going to close by discussing some of the implications, I think, for uh, future research on spatial justice and human security in the Americas. Now, uh, I'm a political scientist, and in recent years, political science has uh, increasingly focused on crime as we kind of began to recognize the complex ways that crime and criminal violence impact politics and economies and societies and communities. And my work draws on important insights from this research, but it departs from it in several, several ways. First, I kind of shift the emphasis away from a focus on drug violence uh, to consider instead extortion and related everyday forms of violence. So our, our early emphasis in political science on really kind of spectacular acts of drug-related violence 
while very important, I think led us to overlook the ways in which citizens in the Americas, in Latin America and in the Caribbean, experience different types of crime on an everyday basis. So while not as easily observable as drug-related violence, these other forms of everyday violence are no less important for our theoretical understanding of how crime and criminal violence impact people's political beliefs and preferences, their economic fortunes and their social relations. So by expanding our scope of analysis, I think we can more fully understand the reality of crime and violence in the region and its implications. And second, I introduced victims into a political science literature that with, with very few exceptions has largely focused on states and criminal actors. And this focus on states and criminal actors is important. It helps us understand the conditions that shape the relations between the two. But as I increasingly found as I was doing this work, without bringing victims into the analysis more squarely, we really risk missing an important factor in the ways that criminals and states interact with each other. And to do so, to bring them in, as I'll talk about, I found it particularly useful to use an ethnographic approach to better understand how victims interpreted the processes and the meanings of criminal victimization and how those interpretations informed their preferences and their actions regarding their beliefs about the state, their beliefs about their own political subjectivity, and how to resist victimization. So in other words, by thinking about criminal victimization as something that happens to people, we overlook when and how victims of crime exercise agency in response to victimization as well. So now, what do I mean by resistance here? Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, I define resistance by what I show here on the screen, uh, which are strategies outside of the rule of law that victims direct at criminal actors to negotiate and or prevent their victimization. The idea here is that in contexts where states cannot or will not uphold the rule of law, victims are not simply helpless in the face of powerful armed criminal actors. Uh, and they don't simply try to be resilient in the face of that victimization. Instead, they often try and contest their victimization in different ways. So he, I focus on strategies outside of the rule of law because I think it helps us to see how in these very difficult settings, victims can undertake strategies that themselves contribute in some ways to the very violence and insecurity that we normally only attribute to criminal actors or to state actors. And in my field work, I identified and analyzed four different strategies of resistance. In Medellin, Colombia, which I'll be talking about a little bit more later, I found informal street vendors engaging in everyday resistance against extortion. Everyday resistance is individual level practices, discourses, other non-violent individual, individual level behaviors that victims use to contest the terms of their victimization. In parts of El Salvador, I identified piecemeal vigilantism, where a few small scale farmers extorted by gangs would occasionally come together to work with handfuls of individual police to jointly carry out extra legal violence against individual members of criminal gangs. In Michoacan, in southwestern Mexico, I studied collective vigilantism, sustained, highly organized collective violence undertaken by victims that target their criminal victimizers, but also target elements of the state itself, such as the police. In this case, the victims that engaged in collective vigilantism were avocado and berry farmers. And I also found that the strategies of resistance can change over time, even in one locality. In the case of Michoacan, those same farmers engaged, that engaged in collective vigilantism would ultimately come to work with elements of the state, including elected officials and police, to produce, to co-produce local order in ways that strengthened and undermined the formal rule of law. So similar forms of criminal victimization, different strategies of resistance, why? What I found was that three factors help us to better understand why victims pursue different strategies of resistance. The first factor is the time horizons of criminal actors. So I argue that criminal actors' time horizons, whether they feel that their control over territory is secure or not, affects how they interact with the people that live and work those territories, which influences whether victims prefer to negotiate victimization or try to end it. Second, I focus on the nature of the local political economies. I argue that these vary in terms of relations among victims and between them and political authorities. And that variation influences the capacity of victims to mobilize collectively to resist victimization. And the third variable I look at here, I argue whether police are captured by criminal actors influences the availability of the police as a resource for victims who are mobilizing resistance, uh, where in some instances, police take part in victims resistance, including extra legal practices. But in other cases, police that are captured by criminal actors 
are obstacles to, even targets of victims' resistance. So the intersection between these three variables leads to very distinct strategies of resistance. Now, I don't have time to walk through this entire argument in the cases today, so what I'm going to do is focus on one case, that of everyday resistance by informal street vendors against criminal extortion in Medellin in Colombia. Medellin is a fascinating example of how formal and informal politics intersect to generate seeming or apparent order. This was a city that was infamous throughout much of the 20th century as one of the most violent cities on earth, in part due to a robust illicit drug trade. But starting in the early 2000s, homicide levels dropped significantly. A string of elected mayors from outside the traditional political parties instituted several innovative, progressive urban renewal projects that tried to address issues of socioeconomic inequality, uneven access to the state. But many researchers, including Professor uh, Abello Colac, Enrique Desmond Arias, uh, Angelica Dura Martinez, myself, and others, We've argued that the decline in violence and that seeming order cannot be explained without also considering how informal politics intersect with formal politics to shape order and urban governance, especially in this case of Medellin. So by informal politics here, I'm referring to the, to the reconfiguration of local illicit markets and the strategic decision by powerful criminal actors to actually reduce levels of violence as a way to limit attention to their illicit dealings and take pressure off local authorities to intervene in those illicit economies. So order and security in this city are the product of coexistence and sometimes active cooperation between the state and criminal actors. And it's within this kind of broader context of formal politics and criminal politics that I studied and un tried to unpack a specific case of ongoing resistance to criminal victimization. So in this case, I studied a group of about 400 informal street vendors that worked every day of the week in an open air market right in the city center, only a, a short walk from the city's municipal offices, including the mayor's office. Remarkably, this, this close to the center of the local state, the market was controlled by a criminal gang that was aligned with a larger drug trafficking group in Medellin. The gang extorted the vendors on a regular weekly basis for set amounts of money, uh, and they used the threat and the use of violence to ensure that the vendors would pay them. Now, the vendors in this case lacked the ability to engage in collective resistance, in part because of the atomized nature of their political economy. They lacked strong ties among themselves, but also had very weak ties to local politicians and political parties that they might have been able to turn to. But they also faced a local police that was complicit in their victimization. It was common knowledge among the vendors in this market that the police patrolling the open air market were paid off by the criminal gang to allow the gang to extort, but also to engage in drug sales and other illicit economies. And so this effectively limited the ability of the vendors to turn to the state for help. For example, as part of my research, one of the techniques that I used or one of the methodologies that I used was focus groups. And within these focus groups, I would ask uh, uh, vendors to draw what generated security or insecurity for them in their places of work in the open air market. And here's one vendor's drawing on the screen that they did during uh, a focus group that I conducted in 2016 in Medellin. Vendors that participated uh, were asked again to make these drawings and to share them with fellow, with fellow participants. This drawing is by a vendor that I call Paula. And when asked to describe her picture for the focus group participants, Paula said the following, and I'm quoting here, she said, if I see a thief, a delinquente, and tell the police, the policia, then the police should take him away. Se lo deben llevar to jail, to the CAI, uh, which is a sort of small police station. But instead, they will go around the corner and make a deal, se arreglan, where the police take off the handcuffs, the esposas, in exchange for some money. And if the thief offers enough money, the police will tell them who reported him, the sapo, the snitch. And they will come to where I am working, trabajando, and they will kill me, me matan. And indeed, during the, the four months that I spent in this particular informal market, several individuals were, were killed uh, when, out of sheer frustration with this criminal extortion that they were experiencing, they turned to local police, and the local police allegedly reported to the local criminal gang who had, been, uh, who had uh, reported to, uh, them to the police. So in this particular case, the state is quite unavailable as an ally for resistance. So you have a very difficult set of circumstances. 
But to understand the resistance in this case, I argue that to, we first have to understand victimization, right? I argue that we need to move away from thinking about crime as this kind of one-time physical event, and instead think about victimization as a process that involves a crime, but that also involves efforts by the criminal actors and the victims to contest different forms of power. So here I draw from a broader literature on state society relations to think about <clears throat> different strategies of criminal domination that have the shared goal of extracting a resource from the victim, but use distinct practices with slightly distinct objectives. So in the case of the informal vendors in Medellin, for example, the criminal gang that extorted them used a variety of these practices. To extract money, it was necessary to use and threaten physical force. But as the vendors who participated in interviews and focus groups told me, victimization was also about the ways that the criminal actor tried to limit their ability to contest extortion through practices of social domination. So this involved things such as the criminal actors constantly insulting the vendors, humiliating them in public in front of each other, forcing them to watch each other be humiliated, reminding the vendors that broader social norms in Colombia depicted the vendors as worthless and disposable parts of society. The criminal gang also made clear time and time again to the vendors that within the political realm, they had no one they could turn to for help, not even the police, that theoretically is the most tangible element of the state on the streets. As the vendors noted during focus groups, members of the gangs would at times taunt them by encouraging them to call the police. Because as the, as the gang would say, as the gang members would say, quote unquote, it's more likely that the police work for us than for you. By thinking about victimization only as physical violence or the first or the forced turnover of material goods, we lose sight of these other aspects of the process of victimization. But likewise, we lose sight of how victims exercise agency. Indeed, the vendors engaged in subtle practices of everyday resistance against these different forms of criminal domination. To contest material domination, the vendors would engage in very contentious, but also nonviolent individual negotiations with the gang to reduce the amount of money they would have to pay. And what mattered here, according to the vendors, was not necessarily that they got to pay less under criminal extortion, but that they managed to deny the criminal actors the full extent of what they demanded. Or as one vendor noted, when you don't give them, the criminals, everything they want, you show them, you make them see that you are not some little dog following them and obeying them when they say, sit. Vendors also contested social domination, do do domination, using rhetorical strategies that pushed back against the criminal actors and their efforts to humiliate them. For example, members of the criminal gang would often try to hide drugs and even weapons in the vendor's merchandise that the gang members could then sell or use to defend their turf. From the perspective of the vendors, this was further evidence of disrespect by the gang members. In turn, vendors would use rhetorical strategies to try and make clear that they viewed themselves and the gang members as equals and not subordinates to the gangs. So they argued, they screw us by hiding drugs in our merchandise. They begin to sit around and we see them, crack pipes, crack rocks, all mixed in our merchandise. And inside of ourselves, we say, oh God, not again. People using us, disrespecting us because we're disposable. But on the outside, we have to walk carefully and do the dance. So we say, look boys, the thing is that everyone here, you and me, we're all working. This is my business. And if I get caught with your product, that it's my business that suffers. And finally, the vendors also resisted political domination. At times, they would purposefully speak in loud terms, in loud tones with their neighboring vendor about how they had rights as citizens of Colombia, how the constitution gave them these rights to work, to be safe from physical harm. And they would have these conversations, interestingly, and very strategically, when the gang members were, were within earshot, right? And in conversations with the vendors, they indicated that this was on purpose to remind the criminal gang members that the vendors were not without political voice. Now, this is in a way to end criminal victimization, right? Because of their limited capacity for collective action and the capture of the police, victims could not engage in other more visible strategies intended to, to end their victimization. But I think by centering victims in the analysis, we're able to see how victims may use other more subtle strategies that enable them to negotiate some aspect of material domination and social domination and political domination, but also to reclaim social dignity and political worth. In terms of sort of some takeaways here, on the one hand, I think what it shows is a need for us to start thinking, at least in political science, I think others, other disciplines have, have gone further in, in, in this respect, but at least in political science to go beyond attention to the spectacular drug violence, which is certainly important, but to also pay attention to everyday, less easily observable forms of crime and violence to enrich our understanding 
of these dynamics and security and insecurity. In terms of thinking about victims, bringing them more closely into the center of our analyses, but also taking them out of the black box that we usually put them in, again, I think that can reveal very theoretically surprising and then times violent forms of agency under very difficult circumstances. And in terms of sort of the broader methodological takeaway, one of the things that I think I, I would argue is that the politics of crime and violence vary across small urban geographies. So I think we need to compare political geography of crime and violence, not only across cities, across the Americas, Latin America and the Caribbean, but also within cities themselves to help us understand micro level forms of governance, both formal politics and criminal politics, but also agency by victims. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for such a powerful uh, presentation that you managed to uh, to deliver within the, the 18 minutes and uh, there's so much to discuss and unpack. So um, if you have questions for Professor Moncada, please uh, add them to the chat and at the end we'll have an opportunity to, to address the questions. Uh, our second speaker for tonight is Dr. Alexandra Bello Colac. Alexandra Bello Colac is a Leverholm Early Career Fellow at the London School of Economics, Latin America and Caribbean Center. Her research focuses on dynamics of urban violence and insecurity, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean. She has undertaken ethnographic and participatory research in urban communities affected by historically high levels of violence and has also co-developed a methodology to work with particularly affected groups and communities and conducted collaborative research with the aim of improving human security in cities in various countries. Welcome, Alexandra. I'll pass on the floor to you now. Thank you, Luisa. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm honored by the invitation by CERLAC to share this space with you, this virtual table. Um, let me share my screen, hopefully without any issues, technological glitches. Um, are you seeing my screen? Think it's working. Please give me a shout if it's not. Right, well, thank you so much again. I am really pleased to be here, being able to share some of the ideas that come out of the collaborative work and the participatory research that we have been doing in the last 10 years in Latin America in collaboration with grassroots organizations, civil society organizations, and academics from various cities in the region. Um, the title of this pre presentation is Humanizing Security in Latin America and Caribbean, which is also part of the title of one of the most recent articles I wrote with my colleague Jenny Pierce. And um, it's going to tell you a little bit of the story of our work that has been trying to rethink violence and insecurity in, in Latin America. I would like to start this presentation by just recognizing that in the last uh, three decades, uh, there has been an explosion in the number of initiatives and efforts to reduce violence and prevent crime um, in the Global South in general. So the ODC, OECD, and the UNDP, for example, in 2012, were recognizing that uh, since the 90s, and especially after the mid 2000s, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Southeast Asia, but especially in Latin America and the Caribbean, there has been an increment in the amount of um, responses and programs and initiatives um, to try to prevent violence. So Latin America and the Caribbean actually has become a sort of laboratory for, for efforts to contain and prevent violence. The Igara Pay Institute um, actually found out that since the 90s and in 2013, at least 1,300 initiatives and programs have been in, in, implemented in the region, mostly in Brazil, Colombia, and other cities in Central America. So we are actually a source of innovation. Um, most of these efforts that involve a lot of resources from national and local governments by development agencies have been focusing on reaching, you know, changing policing strategies, improving state institutions, especially enhancing the capacity of the security sector to deal with the complex problems of insecurity in the region. Um, strengthening the army and the military forces in, in the region has become key, especially under this big umbrella of the war on drugs that has shaped the security agenda in the region. 
Um, but there have also been, you know, mixes and combinations uh, of these type of traditional kind of approaches with environmental design, with, uh, in, you know, experimentation with public transport, but also efforts to even implement socioeconomic prevention programs. Despite these efforts and a lot of resources, this, the region keeps being affected by such high levels of violence. We keep living in a, in a deep security crisis that after the pandemic, we just can only expect that it's gonna get worse. And the visible signs of this crisis, obviously we all know them, is very high levels of lethal and non-lethal violence that makes us the most violent region in the world. Um, and that comparing with other regions in the world just show how pervasive the problem is in, in the region. I mean, we have had really high levels of, of lethal violence and the problem is that, you know, the, the problems has been getting worse even before the pandemic. Every year, the homicide rates, the average homicide rate in the region was increasing 3.7% each year. Now with the pandemic, you know, things don't look, um, look even more pessimistic. Now, obviously that violence in the region has a very urban Face. And again, we have some of the most violent cities in the world located in our region. But the problem is not just the intensity of the problem. The problem is also the complexity. And then Eduardo was sharing a little bit of, of that, that call for recognizing these other forms of violence that are pervasive to, to living in, in the urban space in, in Latin America. And how many of these violences, lethal and non-lethal forms of violence, keep interacting, reinforcing, reinforcing each other in what some of our colleagues like Caroline Moser or Dennis Rogers call violent change. So gender forms of based violence, extortion, sexual violence, violence against children and young people keep mixing with other forms of political motivated violence, violence emerging from organized crime. So is this complexity that we have to be looking at uh, and also looking at how we have created or we have allowed to create context in Latin America where violence becomes chronic or what Jenny Pierce and Tani Adams have, con have called this context in which violence keeps reproducing inter intergenerationally. Um, in ways in which various um, socialization spaces become, um, you know, sources of, of violence. Um, so these are very kind of clear symptoms of the crisis, but I want to kind of highlight two in particular, two problems in particular that, that have inspired our work. And the first one is a recognition that security responses um, keep reproducing violence, not just direct forms of violence. We all recognize, you know, the problems in terms of human rights violation by state agents, by security forces in the region, how after social instability, you know, police forces, even the well-trained police forces in Chile or some of the most professional police forces in Colombia, for example, resort to violence when they have to deal with complex problems uh, in our cities. Um, but there is also these other forms of reproduction of violence through narratives and practices that condone, justify, and sometimes even glorify violence against certain groups in society that are seen as criminal, as problematic, and that, you know, it, it can actually reproduce cultural and symbolic forms of violence. And obviously, you know, the, this combination just justifies also structural forms of violence. So this problem of how security provision, despite all these efforts we have been doing in the last three decades, um, keeps making security provision reproduce violence is a key problem. And the other problem that I want to highlight as well is the fact that it's again, um, something that speaks to what Eduardo was telling us that happens in Medellin. And it's like security efforts and security policies in the region um, seem to be focusing on strengthening the state capacity to fight wars, but not necessarily the capacity of the state to protect citizens and protect communities from the kinds of risks and threats that affects people's lives daily for the type of problems that affect their livelihoods, their dignity and their access to rights. Um, and I chose this, this photo just because I think it's very symbolic. I mean, you see here a well-trained, well-equipped um, police officers, these are military police in Brazil, but it's a very kind of common photo we see now, uh, image we see now in Latin American cities where we see police officers patrolling communities with the military uh, or soldiers. And then I ask, I mean, I, I ask myself, you know, all these efforts in training them in, in the equipment they use, how much of these efforts and resources 
um, are actually giving the skills to these state actors to actually protect those children uh, next to them from the type of problems that they face daily. How, how, um, how, equip, how well equipped are they to be able to protect those two girls is something that has been bugging us for a long time. And with those two problems with security provision in Latin America in our heads, we started this intellectual journey, how I call it. Um, and when I, I say we, I talk about colleagues of mine from the Observatory of Human Security in Medellin, but also my, my friend and colleague uh, Jenny Pierce here in the UK. And we started this journey trying to unpack what does security means for those people who live in this context of chronic violence, for the people who are at the crossroads of many forms of vulnerability, for the people who experience poverty, inequality in their daily lives, for people who experience discrimination for being women, for being black, for being young, for being migrants, displaced. And this is kind of the key question that started the whole process of the last 10 years of our work on, on um, on security and, and, and violence. And it's, we started asking to those people in this context, what does security means to you? And what we found is that while people were obviously concerned with the kind of traditional things we associate with security or our feeling of insecurity, which is, you know, being protected from harm or being, you know, safe and, and keep our property safe, people in this context would have a wider range of preoccupations and, and, and worries. Um, we have people telling us safety is more about living without the fear and or the anguish of not knowing how they're going to feed their children tomorrow or having the fear of, of living in, in places where they know their house might collapse anytime or next time it rains because they live in high risk uh, communities with unstable um, housing conditions or security for them also means living without the fear of exercising their rights, including the right to be who they are even if they are homosexuals or if they are from a minority or, or security for them is also walking free um, and knowing that them or their girls will, will not become booty of war in the wars in gang confrontations. And also security is also about the certainty of knowing that if something that happens, uh, there is someone to resort to. So this idea of the street vendors that Eduardo was telling us about, they know they cannot resort to the police. That is a big, an amplifier of the feeling of insecurity for people in this context. So what these notions of security, what we start finding is what this was telling us is, or what it was revealing is another phase of, of inequality in, in the region, right? The inequality in terms of the type of protection that is available to different sectors of population in our societies, and also the type of inequality in the way we experience insecurity. And it was also revealing um, a very multidimensional understanding of, of security, a, a very differentiated experiences of, of insecurity. So in this intellectual journey, we ended up developing a methodology that we call co-constructing security from below, which was a methodology meant to help us work with communities as active partners in the process of producing new knowledge about security in this context, but knowledge that aim to be practice oriented, knowledge that will help us not just understand what is happening, but also help find solutions that might be relevant to this local context. And for developing the methodology, you know, we inform ourselves with the work of uh, Latin American uh, thinkers like Pal Orlando Falsborda, uh, Freire, and uh, we developed this approach that aimed to be interactive in terms of seeing the production of knowledge as, as interactive, not extractive, uh, as developing horizontal relations with participants and the residents of these communities, and as an approach to be able to, to put people at the center of the inquiry of security. Um, that help us, what we, what, as I'm going to argue, uh, help us develop this form of security consciousness that could inspire new security practices and new security thinking um, in this context. So in order to make this happen, to, we were lucky enough to be able to work with a very diverse group of um, researchers. So in each context where we work, so this methodology, I must say, um, we started it in Medellin, in some of the most affected communities in Medellin, but then in the last 10 years, we have been able to use it and adapt it and improve it in 11 cities in the region, cities in Mexico, in El Salvador, in Honduras, um, and in Jamaica. Um, 
And the idea was that we could develop partnerships with residents of these communities that work with academics and pre-academics, what we call these members of civil society organizations, where um, in the process of producing knowledge. So we could work throughout the whole research process, analyzing data together, collecting the data, producing the outputs, disseminating the knowledge. So the whole process was not just in hands of academics. It was a whole collective and interactive process that allowed us to um, work with a wide range of groups. The idea was not just to understand community as a unifying kind of actor, but understanding that within a community, there are many voices, many experiences. So we um, develop methods and strategies to be able to work in a community with different groups. So we work with uh, we work with uh, young people, we work with children, with groups of women, with members of the LGBT community, Afro descendants, indigenous um, members of indigenous communities. In the whole process of trying to understand the security problems that were affecting them, and also trying to find solutions, um, what we found in this process is that in all the contexts where we have worked, people have this integral and multidimensional understanding of security. In some contexts, we use the notion of human security that became a key, key as in uh, being able to unlock very difficult conversations about the problems that people were facing on their daily lives around various dimensions of the life. So problems that were affecting their personal security, but also problems that were affecting their economic security, um, that were affecting their possibility of participating as citizens, um, factors that were affecting their community relations. So through this notion, we were able not just to unpack the kind of wide range of problems that were affecting people's lives and that were feeling violence in this context, but also to see that the interconnection between these problems and, and create a little bit of a map of what I call um, a systems of human insecurity in this context. So even in context where where we did not use human insecu human security as a key concept because we not always we not always impose that let's say the idea was not to impose the, the notion of human security but just to kind of from below try to understand what what was security in this context even in in, in cases in projects where for example communities did not um, even had the notion of security, which was the case in Guatemala, for example, where we were with a group of young women from the Ixil community that did not have in their local language, um, in their native language, the, the, the concept for security. There was not a specific translation for this notion. But even in their, in their um, own understanding, security meant the protection of the web of life of what it allowed to, to, to make a reality, this notion of the buen vivir. So that notion, it was very similar to what we have been finding in the other context, um, in other places in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So the idea that security and safe spaces for women and young people, for example, meant not just a material space, a material, uh, material conditions that allow them to live with dignity, but also the, the possibility of establishing relations that are protective, that offer supportive networks to deal with the complex problems of life they face was key to understanding this, this um, multidimensional understanding of security, as I call it, and also to understand that the type of unidimensional um, forms of security provision that we have at the moment in Latin America do not respond and are not capable of addressing this type of complexity, this type of complex experience, experience of insecurity that people are having um, in their communities. And the problem as well is, is that these unidimensional security strategies we are seeing implemented in the region depart from very simplistic diagnosis of the problem, mostly assuming that the problem is the, the expansion of illegal economies, the sophistication of organized crime, and yes, that is one factor. But then in order to understand and address the complex problems we have in the region, we have to widen and challenge those simplistic ideas. So in order to be able to kind of grasp that complexity, it was very important for us to recognize the knowledge and the capacities of the people who live in this context, to be able to recognize them as partners and to create new knowledge to take into account their own ways of understanding and making sense of their reality and combined with the type of academic tools we have 
um, at our disposal in, in academic research. So we created a, a little bit borrowing from the Sousa Santos, these ecologies of knowledge, and to create different methods by which we could then make sense of the problems that people were experiencing, um, and also trying to find solutions and trying to understand what was the impact of the type of responses that were being implemented in this context. Um, so we use peace circles, we use participatory documentaries, we use graffiti tours, uh, performance workshops, all sorts of, of new strategies to be able to unpack those realities. Um, in some cities, at least in five of the cities where we work, we were able to build what we call human security agendas. Those human security agendas were the way in which we systematize this learning and this knowledge we co-produce with communities that contain participatory diagnosis of the security problems, but also propositions and ideas for state actors, for civil society, and for the communities themselves. So these were not lists of complaints. These were uh, propositional knowledge. There was ideas of, of, of how we can prioritize certain problems in order to find what needs to be done in each community, but also ideas of how different actors could contribute to building environments and communities that could address these problems of violence. So again, this agency issue was very important in our research as well, because the research produced not only knowledge, but it also through this humanized security consciousness, it enabled some forms of agency as well. Agency that was very useful to rethink security. Agency in the form of breaking silences in some communities that were taboo topics people would not discuss, most of them are, are around violence against women. We had in Mexico, for example, one of the indigenous communities where we work, they were very proud of themselves because they have created this self-defense strategy that they have keep out uh, the, the cartels and the organized crime and they were very safe. But when we found out there were high levels of violence experienced by young women, for example, because according to the tradition, when they get married, they have to go and live with the, with the husband's family. And then in those contexts, they were being harassed and experienced a lot of violence in this kind of safe spaces of the home. So we broke some of these silences. We opened conversations that help people rebuild relations and spaces of social interaction. In some cases, people found agents in the way they could participate in public security debates in, in Tegucigalpa, for example. Women took their security agenda and presented it to the local com security committee of the, the district. And they actually won a seat um, and they got a representation seat in that committee that shaped security policy in Tegucigalpa. Um, in a, in Apatzingan in Michoacán as well, some collectives were able to organize and think of strategies to advance these security agendas. And the idea is this, and even our observatory of human security was created. So just to conclude, and I know it's difficult to be hopeful these days um, based on what is happening in the region, based on, especially after the pandemic, but I would use the research that we have done in the last 10 years to kind of remind ourselves that it's possible to put people needs, uh, people's needs and rights at the heart of security provision. And when we do that, we, we need to move away from the repressive, the punitive and dehumanizing practices that we have been using the last decades and move towards humanizing and humanized security. But for that, we need to challenge the analytical and conceptual frameworks we are using. And we also need to pay attention to agency and the capacity of people on the ground that Anna Eduardo was also highlighting. We can see that it's possible to support and enable those forms of agency that contribute changes in, in security provision. And our research also shows that if we can be hopeful about anything is that it is possible for, for people living in the most affected areas to contribute to rethink security and even to develop new practices that might help us humanize security. So thank you very much. And um, that these are some just details where you can find more information about our work and I look forward to, to the questions and comments. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation, uh, Dr. Alexandra Avello. Uh, I'll keep receiving questions. I started to receive some, keep sending them and we'll um, have a, a few minutes at the end to, uh, to, for our speakers to, to address those questions. And um, now I would like to invite 
Uh, Dr. Jovan Scott Lewis, he's an associate professor and chair of the Department of Geography at the University of California, Berkeley. He received his PhD in anthropology from the London School of Economics. His research is concerned with the articulations of racialized poverty, which he examines through racial capitalism, underdevelopment, and radical terms of repair. His work in Jamaica on these topics culminated in Scammer's Yard, the crime of Black repair in Jamaica. Um, and he has several uh, upcoming publications. Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Jovan Scott Lewis. Now you have the, the floor. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, thank you to the organizers for having us here today, um, my co-panelists, um, the wonderful uh, Dr. Beverly Mullings for serving as discussant, as well as everybody in the, the audience. Thank you for sharing your evening uh, with us. So <clears throat> in my book, Scammer's Yard, The Crime of Black Repair in Jamaica, I tell the story of three poor black young men in Montego Bay who seeking more than economic opportunity turned to what is known as the Jamaican Lotto Scam. Their turn to the scam was part of the long history of post-emancipation Jamaican political economic underdevelopment. The Caribbean spatial fix in this history produced what I termed sufferation, an ontological political economic condition of chronic and structural impoverishment from which only a radical departure could break Jamaicans free. The scammer crew, <clears throat> comprised of friends Omar Jr. and Duane engaged in such a radical departure by using internet calling apps to scam white and elderly North American victims under the pretense of representing a credit agency, offering reimbursement for overpayment for incorrectly calculated interests. The crew read their scam as responsive to Jamaica's history of underdevelopment and its impact on their lives. Through a novel framework of injury and debt, they figured their white American victims as complicit, complicit in Black Jamaicans' systemic exploitation and therefore deserving of their victimization. The scammers asserted that these American victims inherited the debt of colonial harm perpetrated by Great Britain's colonial domination over the country and their ancestors by their whiteness and wealth. The wealth differential between scammers and their victims spoke to, to that inheritance through the accumulation of wealth for whites and its attainment through the disenfranchising exploitation of black people. The scam, therefore, was a means of reparation. Injury for the crew was notably less about the crimes of slavery and colonialism and was most painfully identified in their current state of poverty. Indeed, they found the fact that they were intelligent, talented even, yet still incapable of meaningfully, meaningfully finding opportunity to be the injury that required redress and not slavery. With the Jamaican legal and political landscape in the early years of the scam, <clears throat> which began around 2008, that effectively allowed the scheme to be practiced without impunity, scammers like the crew earned unprecedented amounts of money. I completed it my research in about 2012 with the impression that the crew members and indeed many other active scammers were reaching a turning point in how Jamaicans and poor Jamaicans specifically could understand their horizons of opportunity. Of course, this was not as universal a horizon as the one created in the moments of emancipation or independence. Nevertheless, there was a shared sense of optimism, confidence and possibility never experienced or thought attainable among the crew members. Their story then was filled with, even fueled by those same emancipatory and independence qualities. I wrote of the scammers having moved past previous ethical attachments that had in previous generations kept their ancestors locked in the reformulated plantation landscape that was the Jamaican economy. The crew members had become liberated by eschewing respectability the social moral factor that produced fixed notions of success and accomplishment, that given the condition of sufferation had limited their chances. Building on the new anti-respectability um, ethical genre identified and defined during the ascent of the dancehall era, poor black Jamaicans were able to finally marry their cultural freedom to a material achievable practice that could bring about economic liberation. <clears throat> 
that freedom was emancipatory, but also reparative. This repair was possible because the injury of slavery persisted unchanged across time. Its ability to produce successive injury inherited in newer iterations of trauma, hardship, and the bondage-like quality that was ontologizing and in placing of suffering. Scammers have shown that one can remedy that first injury, meaning slavery, uh, but fully reconcile its latest and arguably most potent instantiation. Nevertheless, repair at least on the scale of the individual is possible or at least I thought it was. By March 2013, mobilized by victim accounts of individuals in the United States, US senators convened the United States Senate Special Committee about the scam. Senators wrote to US Attorney, or then US Attorney General uh, Eric Holder, imploring the Department of Justice to act on what they saw as a lack of attention being paid to the Jamaican lottery scam. They urged the extradition of scammers from Jamaica which one of the senators thought would have a chilling effect on those who now commit the crime with a sense of impunity. Within months, Jamaica had updated its laws with the Proceeds of Crime Act. In under a year, over 100 scammers had been arrested. The primary targets of the Jamaican and US enforcement agencies investigating the scam were individuals who sold the names and data of victims, which are called legalists. And so they targeted legless brokers like Sanjay Williams. It was an effective strategy because targeting the brokers cut off the source of the leads that kept the scam going, but it also created scarcity in the market for lead lists. As a result, there was an increase in competition for available leads. When they were too hard to come by or prove fruitless or were determined to have already been used, scammers who could still turn a profit during this period became targets of violence. St. James Parish over the following years recorded hundreds of murders annually, accounting for more than 20% of the island's annual homicides. While shocking on its own, the number was especially alarming because St. James Parish, whose capital city, Montego Bay, is popularly known as a tourist epicenter of Jamaica, really never had this kind of reputation. The parish would hardly ever figure in the public imagination as a site of more violence produced than Kingston, the country's capital. Furthermore, the violence was taking place in the small neighborhoods of Rose Heights and Norwood, Flankers and Cambridge, which sat at the outskirts of Montego Bay proper. Jamaica Constabulary Force Corporal Kevin Watson, in a testimony, once claimed that more than 1,000 murders had been attributed to the lottery scam over the past decade. Articles from local newspapers like the Jamaica Gleaner and Observer to global outlets like The Economist aim to untangle the cause for the violence. Gangs were without question to blame. However, gang violence of this magnitude was exceptional. The inducements for gang violence were hypothesized to be a combination of long-term tensions between rival organizations and competition over the gun and marijuana trades. Still, the most cited cause for the violence was where the worlds of lottery scamming and gang violence intersected. The watershed moment in the scam's turn to violence began with the formation of <clears throat> the Lottery Scam Task Force, the introduction of the Lottery Scam Bill, and the updating of the Proceeds of Crime Act. However, the apparent economic relationship between updating those laws and the increased violence has largely gone unmentioned in the media. Over time, the financial circumstances produced by this succession of regulatory acts created an environment of violence that was no longer exceptional, but merely a part of Jamaica's history of modern violence. One of the inducements for the increased involvement of gangs in the scam, and thus the rise in murder rate, was the sheer profitability of the scam compared to other forms of organized crime. As a result, gangs typically involved in the guns and drug trades entered into the practice of lottery scamming and brought along the usual market tool of violence. Ultimately, the geography of violence had shifted, which in its unprecedented form and cause produced panic among the public and in the government. On the back of this violence, Prime Minister Andrew Holness declared a state of public, public emergency in St. James Parish. While only intended initially to last 14 days, he would extend it several times to encompass more than a year. 
Jamaica Defense Force soldiers fled the Montego Bay and the neighboring areas, picking up where local police were seen to have failed. Checkpoints and curfews slowed the movement of people, but also hopefully guns. Quiet came over the city slowly as suspects were arrested. Sting operations spread farther into the parish and into neighboring parishes. The Prime Minister, Andrew Holdens, identified what he called a criminal ecosystem that the state of emergency efforts were tasked with bringing down. In response to what would become a cascading of criminal activity and violence across the country, <clears throat> the state of emergency was actually extended to more areas of Jamaica and in fact continued to this very day, having overlapped with the COVID-19 curfew put into place in March 2020. It seemed that the Jamaican state tolerated the practice of scamming for as long as it could, while up until that point, they benefited from the unregulated stream of capital to, that it brought to its shores. As during the year of my primary field where lottery scamming was noted to have brought in $300 million US into the Jamaican economy. So the curtailment of money transfer privileges, the primary means by which scam uh, funds were facilitated to Jamaica from the crackdown of extraditions and the killings these were all necessary foreclosures of what scammers had aspired towards, right? Which was a Jamaica as a space of opportunity. And as cynical as that claim might be in the context of the violence, indeed, as insensitive as it might sound to make such a claim, opportunity had materialized for the scammers. And that opportunity had burst the restraints of the sufferation that they grew up with it. The violence that came to the lot of the scam produced a Montego Bay um, and that was produced in Montego Bay was neither suddenly nor sadly um, formed. The, the violence, nor sadly surprisingly formed. The violence and the crime that came to be associated with the lottery scam were products of external constrictions of the scam's practice. They were also due to the sheer success of the scam, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so proceeds from the scam began to mix with those from drugs and guns and the everyday violence of extortion, producing what we might call as a kind of normative narrative of violence in the country. Indeed, Deborah Thomas says that it's an old cliche that within Caribbean studies, if one wants to study violence, one goes to Jamaica. Indeed, violence often surrounds and structures social life in Jamaica, or at least so the story goes. If violence surrounds and, and structures social life in Jamaica, then potentially as important, it structures Jamaica's narrative. The structural and paradigmatic violence that Frank Wilderson, Wilderson notes, right, uh, that assumes Black people's cognitive maps and conceptual frameworks is at play here. The question then is, well, what does the narrative of violence mean for Jamaica as a site for living? Making the scammer's experience amount to something as consequential as a major narrative in Jamaica. <clears throat> Does it add the understanding that Jamaica is a place that is narratively saturated, if not suffocated by violence? How else might we capture a witness and give account then to alternative frameworks that can take root and shift the general order of Jamaican society and its narrative if we forego talking about violence? Again, Wilderson writes of working to make sense of violence without falling victim to its overwhelming and disorienting capacities. Writing within and alongside, but not necessarily about violence, Wilderson advises that we must somehow make violence indexical of that which exceeds narration, while being ever mindful of the incomprehension the writing would foster, the failure, that is, of interpretation, where the indices of, uh, where were the indices to actually escape the narrative. The observed and analyzed violence in Black conditions can easily overwhelm and crowd out the possibility of other narratives. <clears throat> the risk is that not writing about violence could make those conditions unrecognizable, even incomprehensible. In other words, can we understand Jamaica without violence? To answer that question, I want to, for a moment, bracket out the scammer of, this, of Scammer's Yard, leaving only the geography. In Jamaica, residents who share common facilities and outdoor space at the back of an apartment lot or complex are considered to live in a yard. The yard can and often does extend to the entire neighborhood, expanding as far as one limits of belonging. In fact, 
Jamaica itself in diasporic circuits constitutes what is understood as just yard. Yards serve as central sites of Jamaican social life and elicit a certain camaraderie, inevitably punctuated by tensions and suspicion. These are the challenges, of course, of living communally. The yard represents a particular geography of shared fate, of community striving, and even, you know, amidst some of those tensions, a sense of belonging. In the yard that this camera is shared, I witness hardships and struggles, and the sharing and celebrating the joys and part of their community. And so while the community's 3,000 residents today might have been considered or might still be considered formally impoverished, I saw aspiration all across their neighborhood, senses of a life that they were pursuing. That aspiration was evidenced in hope-filled conversations among neighbors, proud sartorial presentations at weekend parties, and most visibly by the remaining steel rebar rods that left uncut reached upward through first story rules in anticipation of the eventual second story's addition. Neighborhoods like this can at times seem like what uh, Obika Gray, a political scientist from Jamaica, calls the exotic spaces where economic rep repression forecloses all hope. That repression and its political and economic formations that produce social and economic exclusion enable these communities' residents to generate forms of social autonomy that make these neighborhoods, what Obika Gray again, argues are empowerment zones, where by those same restrictive circumstances, autonomy and promise can flourish. So, but moving past, hinging on the tenuousness of this meaning, meaning moving past the kind of fleeting notion of this hope, bringing the scammer back to the yard requires reconciling the variability and heterogeneity of the Black experience and its multiple orientations. This is a challenge in urban studies writ large with Sue Roderick and Linda Peake and others writing that within this climate of different political possibilities for the urban, a number of competing, conflicting and complementary geographical imaginaries have emerged to make sense of contemporary urbanization. The response has been to move towards a theoretical reconciliation. This is the act of making sense of contemporary urban spaces. And here, this is the act of making sense of Jamaica through violence, or at least our tendency to do so. A reconciliation leads to silences and flattening, thereby reducing the complex multidimensionality of the Black experience, ultimately making it compact and troublingly portable, and therefore extract extractable and exploitable. Certain things can be done in other words, to a Jamaica that is neatly and conveniently simply understood as violent. This is a dangerous relational and epistemic reduction, one that becomes a silo of shared suffering, a narrative and ontological cul-de-sac that becomes codified and reproduced through our scholarship and through the geographies of that scholarship's making. Although possibly leading to trouble in the map, where we cannot properly locate Jamaica, call it a form of cartographic anxiety. In other words, what is Jamaica if not violent? We have to resist this reconciliation. Perhaps by returning to our Creole conceptualizations of Caribbean space, we can do so. Either way, we must aim to theorize and practice what Sylvia Winter calls a Jamesian poesis, noting C.L.R. James's ability to theorize while holding multiple contradictions in place. Again, Roderick and Peake argue for a social ontology of the urban that emphasizes that it is exactly the everyday struggle of people, of life, as it is lived in relation to the urban and beyond, that will shift the terrain of urban theory and understanding. In shifting that terrain, we might bring together a definition of Black urban experience that opens up a path to understand Black life, its violence, and its peacefulness in all its contradiction. The result might be a potentially unprecedented understanding of forms of living, of understanding struggles that make the full complexity of Caribbean life as it exists available and appreciated in new ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jovan Scott Lewis, for bringing such a nuanced uh, and complex argument. Much appreciated. Uh, I'll now uh, call our discussant, Professor Beverly Mullings. Uh, Pro Professor Beverly Mullings is uh, with the Department of Geography at Queen's University in Canada. Her research focus is located within the field of feminist political economy, 
she engages questions of labor, social transformation, neoliberalism, and the politics of gender, race, and class in the Caribbean and its diaspora. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Mullings, and I'm going to turn it to you for your, uh, your comments. Wonderful. I'm going to time myself so that I don't speak too much. <laughs> um, this is amazing. This is a lovely um, set of conversations that fit very well together. They all feel to be fragments, uh, pieces in a puzzle that I want to um, reflect upon a little bit. And it's hard being the discussant because everyone's spoken and I'm trying to put all the ideas, the pieces together. But I, I do want to, you know, put this in context. Um, at the end of the 1990s, global institutions like the World Bank began to call our attention to high levels of violence in the Caribbean and Latin America. But those early studies viewed violence and crime largely as behavioral problems linked to the fact, and I put that in parentheses, of, of, of poverty. They saw violence as an outcome of antisocial behavior, primarily among um, gang members and youth. They tended to tie crime and violence largely to the drug trade, and they focused really on measures to combat urban poverty, to build social capital, etc. Much of that work in the late 1990s tended to um, focus on spectacular forms of violence, immediate, explosive, brutal, visible, criminal, things like the gang wars or police brutality or physical violence, but they always, those accounts um, tended to tie violence to criminality. I think much less was done in the 1990s and subsequently much less attention to what Rob Nixon calls slow violence or what Eduardo Moncada calls everyday violence. I see them as somewhat connected. And these are forms of harm that play out over years. They're unnoticed, creeping, uncinematic, with protagonists that really are not so easily identifiable, hard to perceive. And so, you know, when I think about this, this is a narrative that continues to be played out. I, I looked at the most recent, you know, document from the World Bank in 2017. And, and it, it, you know, in this document, it, it um, points to the fact that they think there's a puzzle, puzzle in Latin America and, and the Caribbean. It remains a puzzle as one of the documents states that, you know, despite the good decade of the 2000s, which makes me wonder which 2000s and where, but I think they're speaking primarily about that a period when poverty levels fell, which to me is more a testimony to the places of the strength of family ties and remittance economies. But despite this good decade, levels of crime have persisted. Um, and there's statistics that, that have been provided to show, you know, every 15 minutes, at least four people are killed victims of homicide, you know, 42 of the most of the 50 most violent cities located um, in are located in the region. So when we, we read documents or see narratives like this, we, we're stuck somewhere about how to think about the intractability of violence and how to come to a place of justice. So this is um, where I really thank my colleagues who have just spoken um, because they've helped us to sort of round out a little bit how we should be thinking about violence and how we should be thinking about urban justice. These are three pieces that overlap really quite nicely. Um, I, I appreciated really the attention to the detail of um, extortion and how to understand how victims respond very differently to extortion. I, I really enjoyed listening to thinking about um, questions of, of justice from the bottom up, um, security as below, as um, Professor Bello Polak says. So what this is what I think I've taken away from the three um, presentations. And I'm going to talk about this in relation to what I see as, as these blurred boundaries between violence and crime and between victims and perpetrators. What I think I'm, I'm hearing is 
that where, where there are spectacular forms of violence, the gang wars, um, the lockdowns, etc., where they where they're met by weak state justice, they engender responses from communities that can be both spectacular. And Eduardo, you didn't speak about this, but the spectacular ones I'm thinking here of vigilantism, um, or forms that are are less spectacular everyday forms of resistance, which in your presentation you you spoke of as as discursive, and that there are different outcomes then for, for communities who experience weak forms of state justice, um, and those those experiences are ones of an erosion of trust, um, but funnily a strengthening of the capacity for active citizenship. What I got from Alexandra's um, talk was that when those spectacular forms of violence are met um, by spectacular forms of state justice, and many of your, your um, visuals in your PowerPoint were quite striking, things like militarized state-backed operations, communities might be exposed to heightened levels of risk that endanger their lives and, and their rights. And I, I took quite seriously what you had to say when you spoke about the extent to which then forms of dialogue through community, what you call security um, from below, can create a sense of security, an ability to live without fear. Um, now, when slow forms, or I guess everyday forms, I'm not really sh quite sure, um, <laughs> Jovan, to think through where to put um, scamming in that story, but when they're met with spectacular forms of violence like the extradition, they can obscure the broader structures, poverty, lack of employment, um, racial capitalism that lie at the root of slow, that type of violence, um, the violence of, of extradition, of, of foreign lockdowns, of the, you know, lockdowns by the state, etc. So, so there are ways in which these talks are overlapping. They talk about similar things and different things, but I think they, they actually create a big picture altogether that I want to maybe try and flesh out some of some ideas or some points to talk about from. So I think there is there's a blurring here that that it will be worthwhile us talking a little bit more about, which is you know blurring between violence and crime, and it comes out in the pieces somewhat differently. Um, violence is not always a crime, and and that becomes clear in all all of the pieces. But it depends on the scale and the spaces in which we look for um, violence. Um, that victims and perpetrators are not always on two opposite sides of things. Sometimes perpetrators are victims, but it depends on the scale and it depends on the spaces. So I'll, I'll give a couple of examples just to make that clear. So violence versus crime. Well, it, you know, so much of the focus in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, has been on the drug gangs. And, and are seen to be spectacular sources of violence, are seen to be criminal, they're part of networks, they're engaged in things like um, extortion, and in the case of Jovan's talk, um, they're engaged in things like scamming that really bilk poor old white folks somewhere out of, you know, much, much hard worked and protected incomes, not to make light of that. Um, but it doesn't really tell us about the forms of violence that don't always get seen to be a crime or not treated as a crime. And I'm thinking here of, in, in um, Alexandra's talk, you spoke about intimate partner violence. That still remains quite, quite um, opaque to the state sometimes and to others, depends on communities, whether this is actually criminal or not. Sometimes it's considered to be just the way things are. Um, when I think about violent, violence and crime, again, to think about this at scales beyond the state, we have a tendency to understand violence and crime in the region within the territorial boundaries of the state, what happens at the local level. We don't always look beyond that. We don't always look 
at other scales, including the, the scale of the global or the international and shaping what those outcomes look like. So, so you know, to what extent are the activities of multinational corporations um, that take over the space of the city, how, how does that get, get interpolated in a conversation around violence and crime? When we think about you know, poverty reduction strategies, uh, continued um, lending obligations to the World Bank or IMF, how do we understand these as forms of violence which are not understood as criminal? Then victims and perpetrators, again, very blurred boundaries. And it makes me again think that, that all three talks are pointing to, to forms of violence and forms of urban justice, but at very different scales. And that scale becomes a very important conceptual frame for making sense of um, what is unfolding in very different types of places among different types of people. And if we think about victims and perpetrators, it leads me to continue to think about, you know, the way in which in many of the communities, some of which you have spoken of, that it's not always clear who the victim or the perpetrator is, that there are times when drug gangs or drug lords are understood and protected by community members, and particularly where the state has long abdicated its responsibility for the security, the economic security of ordinary people. So it becomes a sort of interesting blurring of boundaries, um, different scales to think about the problematic of, of violence and justice. So I want to sort of just kind of round up very quickly, I've got a few minutes, for thinking through two things. I think, I think scale is important to a conversation in the region about urban spatial justice and relationality. So Mike, I'm going to have a couple of questions for you. I'm just going to throw them out for things to think about alongside um, your, your presentations. How do you account for the fact that the forms of violence that you've examined are connected to other forms of slow violence at scales that are far beyond the places where the violence is experienced. Um, what does it mean for how you think about the types of interventions that we should be considering and taking up? So, um, Alexandra, when you speak about the humanization of security, I, I guess I'm thinking about what, what are the limits to thinking about tackling crime and violence through humanizing security, especially when communities may not see but may feel um, other types of violences that come from economic policies beyond the spaces of the immediate community. Um, Joan, for your, your work, and I was, I'm drawing more on, on the book as a whole, but I'm curious how um, thinking about the logic of, say, reparations, which is a figures in, in the book Scammer's Yard, I know that. Um, what limits does a logic like that place on the sorts of interventions that we might imagine could take Jamaica out of that place as being only associated with crime and violence, a place where you can do things to Jamaica because of the way that it is imagined to be in the world. What does, what does that, the importance of relationality and scale mean for how you think through the logic of scammers, for example, as um, that logic of reparations? I mean, can we ever think of scammers as, as sheer victims also? of a global system. And Eduardo, you know, when we talk about the recognition of the agency of victims of extortion, how is that tied up or how does that work at multiple scales and through different forms of relationality? I want to just end by saying, you know, maybe it is that we need to think wider than the meaning of violence. Um, that the I, I'm thinking increasingly that, you know, space becomes very important to how we think about urban justice. And so I'm, I want to leave this conversation by saying, perhaps it's, it's important also, as we go forward, like bringing all of these together to think about sites and scales. So when we look at sites 
everyday urban suffering, how do we interpolate or point to the places of responsibility? So I want to add another word to the conversation alongside violence, alongside um, crime and justice, but also responsibility. So when we think about that, when we think about sites of responsibility for everyday urban suffering, what would that mean for how we think about what urban justice looks like? Because I think trying to identify those sites of suffering and the sites of responsibility, most importantly, helps to actually bring the pieces of all of your puzzles together because responsibility is that thing that allows us to think beyond the scale of the local. It begins to allow us to think about questions of how particular devalued bodies get brought into a conversation about crime and injustice. Um, and that really allows us also to think about the many peoples in the Caribbean, as differentiated as you've, you've said, who who don't ever have the chance to simply be who they want to be. And I think that came from what you were saying, um, Alexandra, but, but how, how does thinking about responsibility, thinking about where those sites of responsibility are and thinking about spatializing urban justice. These are some questions that I want to throw out for what I hope will be a really robust conversation for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, these insights. I'm gonna uh, pass it to our panelists who would like to address, uh, to start and respond uh, to Professor Mullings, uh, a comment on relational relationality, on slow violence, on scale. Can I take a, a quick stab at it? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Mullings, for just a wonderful and rich and provocative set of, of comments and reflections. That was really great. Um, one, one thing I wanted to, to kind of reflect on a bit um, is your point about scale and situating the spaces that we're looking at in these broader dynamics, right? And one way to think about it is well, we, if we're going to look at, at neighborhoods, we have to look at city politics. If we're going to look at cities, we have to look at regions, if we're going to look at regions, countries, um, and, 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 and so on and so on. And so one way that, that I've tended to, to think about this is, is thinking about, well, where do these places fall on sort of the global flows, both legal and illegal, right? Um, and if we, we think about sort of sites of drug production, for example, in parts of Latin America, drug transport through the Caribbean uh, and drug consumption there uh, in the United States, parts of Europe. Um, I think that helps us to kind of think a little bit about scales, but also to get to your really provocative point about sites of responsibility, right? Because um, while we can, while all, I think all, all three of us kind of pointed to some localized factors that contribute to the dynamics that we're interested in studying, um, thinking about sites of responsibility should prompt us to also think about sort of global actors that are responsible at a sort of meta macro level, right? For some of these um, global political economies that drive poverty, inequality, drug consumption, drug production, drug trafficking, uh, and, as well as other illicit economies too. So I, I don't know, have a clear answer, but I, I think it's just a rich point. Could I jump in? Michael, thank you for the comments. I think, yeah, thank you. Um, Beverly, I think you, you pose really interesting questions, you know, that bind our, our contributions. And I would like to kind of like tap into one of them, which is, you know, this idea of, of the limitations um, of our understanding of these connections between everyday violences and more structural problems that slow forms of violence. And I think that that was key, you know, a big, big worry in the type of work we were doing, especially because, you know, I really highlight that one of the biggest problems is this simplistic diagnosis of the problem, this narrative, simplistic narratives of, of what is happening in the region. And something that we learned through this conscientization process, which is, and, and then I, I saw there was a question about that, you know, the use of, of Freire in our research, this process of, of, of the possibility of getting more con, a conscientia, right, about 
what is the source of the type of problems we are we are experiencing and that this we had conversations like this with participants with residents you know our, this is a process that sometimes took two years or three years in this community so the initial conversations were about what are the security problems that people would start talking about yes the thieves the drug dealers you know these, these really simplistic narratives that you know they, they kind of um, perpetuate from, from the dominant discourses, but throughout the process of this conscientization by exchanging our knowledge about the history of these problems, how these connect to other socioeconomic dynamics, how, for example, the, the lack of opportunities for young people in some cities um, are connected to the local economy and the way in which the like, capital, you know, the capitalization and the urbanization of capital, let's say, um, has taken place in the cities, people gain more understanding, and we also got more understanding about the particularities. So just to give you three specific examples to make it more clear what I'm talking about. In Tijuana, for example, people could say, you know, um, oh, the problem of violence is that, you know, there is lack of jobs or, um, you know, there is some, um, lack of opportunities for young people, but then we started thinking and the people realized actually that's not the problem in Tijuana. Tijuana is one of the cities with the lowest level of uh, unemployment in Mexico. It's one of the most prosperous, you know, dynamic local economy. The problem is the type of jobs. And then people start thinking, well, what is the type of shifts and what are the like of labor conditions in our local economy? So Tijuana, you know, the big business sector in Tijuana is very proud of saying Tijuana is a, you know, a, a pole of attraction for employment in Mexico. But when you look at people and then see these type of jobs do not give the type of quality of life that allow people to have healthy relations at home because, you know, the shifts, the, the, the payment as well sometimes force people to have to sacrifice, you know, their families, the time and the, and the quality of life. So by having this conversation and connecting these, these issues, um, you know, we were able to kind of have wider un understanding of this, you know, how violences in the everyday kind of connected to these wider structural problems. In Tegucigalpa, women not just talk about the violence they experience at home, they also identify as one of the problems, patriarchal urbanism as one of the problems. And when we talk about what do you mean by that? They say, well, what we mean by that is that in our communities as women, we don't have a space where we can actually sit and gather. You know, you see the young people that they have their corners and they are safe, they can have conversations. But as women, it's very dangerous. We don't have a place to sit in the corner in the community. We don't even have. So this city and this and the changes that have been made in the community have been made for men to enjoy public space. And they were conscious that we were becoming conscious of how this affected their experience of insecurity. And then so proposals in these agendas became not just about like stopping or, you know, putting programs to help women in danger, but also let's talk about the planning projects in this city. In Medellin, it was the same thing. You know, it was, oh, okay, Medellin has reduced violence and so we are experiencing less violence, but actually we have become in the process of making Medellin this successful story of the city that overcome violence, our neighborhoods, you know, we still have a lot of problems, but our neighborhoods became this kind of vitrina, this wind, how do you call it? The, the windscreen, um, the show of, um, you know, to the world. And, and we, um, actually have paid a high price for all this urban transformation. Many people will, were displaced in building those big and mega projects. And nobody talks about those displays, but we know friends. So people are started kind of making this association. And I think that's very important. And I think that's where, you know, where this kind of um, challenging our understandings and also going and digging, you know, at the local level with everybody, with people's daily experiences. And then also using our own knowledge of this wider transnational phenomenon, we can find, you know, you know, a more a, a more suitable perspective, a more accurate picture, let's say, of what is really happening. Thank you, Joven. Yeah, I just, you know, thank you, thank you so much for that, Beverly. Um, you know, the the question is like, why, you know why do we do the violence talk the way that we do it and and what is it about the caribbean as a geography specifically right but latin america you know that we find as you know a, a justifiable act of emphasizing that 
right? When we think about when we think about actual violence, not even exceptional violence, but when we think about actual violence, there are so many more violent geographies on this planet, yet we never frame them as such, right? There are other ethical kind of arena that we allow other geographies to to represent, or at least to have represent them. And so for me, the trouble is, well, what kind of narratives come out of a place like Jamaica, right? Because there's a narrative practice, right, of extraction, right, that, that is modeled off of the materialist history of extraction in the Caribbean, right? And so it's about what is productive, fundamentally. And so what, so what I'm trying to wrestle with is, is, is what is the productivity of the narrative of violence that comes out of a place like Jamaica? In other words, it is the, the, the monocrop, <laughs> if you will, right, of Jamaican productivity. And, and so for me, it's a question of, of how you move outside of that. And, and this is what your questions, right, are, are, are bringing up. Um, and so we've been asking this question, you know, for a while, you know, we can go back to Trio, we can go back to all kinds of people, right? I mean, I, you know, I see Val Carnegie is in the, in the, in the chat, welcome Val. Um, you know, who's, who, you know, who have pushed us to, you know, cease being so attached to these, you know, again, dominant narratives that we've told ourselves that we've inherited effectively from a Western liberal project of sovereignty as to what we are meant to be and how we are meant to orient ourselves and how we are meant to project ourselves. And so the problem is that once we are, you know, once we acquiesce to this normative framework, right, of something like sovereignty, as Caribbean subjects, as Caribbean governments, we find ourselves failing in that model. And so all that's left, right, is the kind of the, the tritus of the narrative. It, it is only it is only the what left, which is which is something like violence. It's something like an aberrant narrative. And that's what I'm trying to get us to think out of. And you know, I, I think the problem is that it, it is so comfortable, it is so, it is so reliable. And so to get to your point of responsibility, the question is, right, you know, to what extent must we question our professional responsibility as scholars, as intellectuals to kind of think past, you know, those limited and convenient and productive frameworks. And, and so this is not to completely avoid the question of violence, because we can't, right, it is there. But it's a question of how do we actually think about the violence as part of this broader kind of, you know, heterogeneous narrative that is in our in my case right in our case caribbean life and jamaican life more specifically how do we find room to make those other narratives kind of open up you know the kind of story of of, of jamaica that doesn't find us trying to wrestle with this binary right of a kind of romanticist or, or you know a tragic notion of what the caribbean story is specifically and so i i, I situate that problem you know, right at the feet of, of, of the question and our investment in the, in the questions of, of violence. And so I think, you know, reparation, to answer that question specifically, you know, it can be a part of that. But, you know, that's why I'm so intrigued by the scammer's claim of repair, you know, more so say than the CARICOM, CAR, uh, you know, reparations commission, because, you know, and I talk about this in the book, the CARICOM model really just reinscribes, you know, that, that old narrative, right, of, of, of social belonging to this, again, Western, you know, sovereign project. And, and what that does, it just leaves open the, the potential for failure, because we know we're going to fail, right? We, you know, we, you know, after emancipation, Jamaica's wanted to produce soap, and the British wouldn't even let us produce soap, right? So, I mean, you know, you have these, you have these long histories of foreclosure and foreclosing the possibilities. So, you know that we're not meant, you know, as a, as a Caribbean space to participate equally, right? That's what Gervan called the rules of the game. But the problem is that we have to find different models to subscribe to, different narratives to subscribe to. And so the question is, are our reparations models going to push that and, and, and do that? Um, likely not, right? Likely not, because we're still stuck in this developmentalist kind of framework of what it means to become, you know, to be a sovereign state. And, and so without that, I don't know what, you know, meaning outside of that, I don't know, I don't know what reparations are ultimately going to do for the Caribbean other than perhaps be some kind of uh, advanced payment on some uh, debt on the horizon, you know? Thank you so much. Um, I'm now gonna, it's 7.44, we're a little bit, uh, yeah, short in time, but we do have uh, time to answer a couple of questions, if everyone is okay. Uh, so there's one 
for, from Marcela Tovar Restrepo about methods, it, but actually that's a good question for everyone. Methods when conducting this type of research. So specifically for Alexandra, the question is about um, developing, a explaining a little bit more about the techniques that you have developed and how you uh, uh, built on Orlando Falsborda, Freire and Moser and yeah, just elaborate a little bit more. Um, Orlando Falls was my professor, so I wanted to <laughs> touch on him. <laughs> yeah. How lucky, Lisa. <laughs> um, well, I'll try to be brief um, and give enough uh, details. I mean, you know, inspired by the EAP, you know, participatory and action-oriented research, you know, we, we kind of kind of recognize, uh, you know, kind of a more critical standpoint from like positive social science. So the idea that, you know, we share the same context with the participants and that the people that we are researching, we are not doing research on people in an extractive way, but we're doing research on people with people that is meant to support struggles for justice and social transformation. It, it was key, you know, to this process of, of thinking how to explore security. Um, and there is this also process of, like I said, recognizing different types of knowledge. So recognizing the type of academic conceptualizing knowledge that academics have, but also recognizing the types of knowledge based on experiences and practice that people have on the ground. And the idea was to kind of first map the type of knowledge and the ways in which people already systematize their own reality. So for example, in Medellin, we found out in some communities, women um, have these spaces, they call it um, spaces of listening. So they just gather, most of them are victims of violence, they have lost children to uh, violence in the communities, and they have these recurrent meetings in which they sew or they um, um, they gather to, you know, to share their experiences and they have their own kind of methods to, to have a difficult conversation. So we recognize these methods so, or displaced people, for example, in Medellin, they have these um, ways in which they will uh, create their own huertas, their own like gardens to provide food for themselves because they are basically starving. They don't have networks in the city. So when they come to the city, they create these huertas. And we, so we create, we combine these kind of techniques and processes and spaces that they exist in this, in this context with the techniques that we know. So we create, for example, a huerta escuela, like a sewing and learning um, space by which we are doing some of the activities the community do, but we are also uh, exploring at least three variables. You know, first is what are the, the events and situations and factors that are creating insecurity, making people insecure. And then um, conversations about what are the responses that the state institutions, but other actors in the community, even the, the citizens themselves are, are doing, are deploying in response to these problems. And then other activities to explore action points. Right, so we have kind of a process by which we work with some of the members of these communities, they become community researchers and they kind of represent, they, they help us map these knowledges, these spaces, and they themselves help um, design strategies and, and um, methods um, that sometimes end up in, for example, like young people in Medellin, they use before graffiti tools became really famous in, in, in Comuna Adresa in Medellin. This is the way which we, we were working with those street artists and they were telling us, you know, a way of, of making sense of our own history of our community is actually going and looking at the graffitis we have made of our friends being killed in the community. So we did, for example, to explore this process of these problems with young people, we did graphic tours, but also having this type of conversation. So if the methods change in each context, you know, it was just adapted. We didn't have to stay. We have to adapt things with young, with children, for example. With children, we did magazines, we did collage of images, you know, things to facilitate. So it very, but the whole kind of principle was to combine local knowledges with our own techniques. We also use ethnographic research, community research, and us, we're filling field diary notes and exchanging and analyzing through qualitative sort of um, softwares, then, you know, this data. So it was a combination of, uh, like I say, of, of um, academic type of um, qualitative methods and local um, knowledges. Thank you. Uh, Jovan or Eduardo, would you like to add something on just the complexity of uh, the methodological com complexity of this type of uh, research? <laughs> 
I mean, what I'll just say very quickly is that there was a, a an opening for me to do the work. Um, you know, I, I went to Jamaica and I did um, my research really in a moment, um, just at the very tail end of, of the, the lottery scam being a tolerated practice. And so, you know, I was very fortunate in that, you know, in addition to my, you know, savvy ethnographic skills, I really did benefit from, from the fact that, you know, scammers were largely comfortable talking with me because there was really this sense of impunity by which they practiced the scam. Um, had I, I think, arrived in Jamaica even a year later, I think it would have, you know, I would have gotten it done still, but it would have been much more complicated, I think. So, I, you know, I, I think it is, it is really important to kind of think about um, the point at which you enter into the, the questions you're asking. And what I've tried to do is try to make sense of that, the temporality of that moment. And I've tried to, you know, kind of re represent that, not as a kind of a, uh, a fully representative, you know, experience, but something that, 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 you know, I've just written something more about this kind of the suspension of the time that I was there and, and what that allows us to do. Um, so we've thought about the ethnographic present, we think about temporality and ethnography. Um, and I think for me, it's a question of thinking about opportunity within the, the, the time frame of your research and what that means and thinking very seriously about it. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add very quickly as well, um, building on those two great points that were just made, um, that for, for my work, part of the challenge was also entering and working within spaces that were actively controlled by and monitored by criminal actors um, and trying to figure out how to do that in a way that was both safe for myself, but also very safe for the individuals that I was interacting with for focus groups, for interviews, um, or that I would even have just have informal conversations with. Um, so that requires a lot of a lot of uh, prep work and a lot of sort of uh, interesting kind of negotiations with a variety of different actors that going back to Beverly's comment uh, earlier as well, makes can often make really clear that blurry, <laughs> oddly enough, make clear the blurriness between victim and criminal uh, in, in a way that, that kind of um, can be really fertile terrain, I think, for thinking about who are these actors? Why am I, why am I sort of putting them in preconceived categories and boxes without first kind of asking who actually they are and how they're perceived within these very communities themselves. Well, thank you so much to all the panelists um, and to our uh, discussant for an amazing, rich, complex conversation. Uh, yeah, we're running really late, <laughs> but I enjoyed the conversation so much. So again, thank you so much uh, for, for to our uh, guests. And I would just like to say in closing that there is going to be another uh, Baptista event in February. So stay tuned, stay tuned for the next conversation in February. And yeah, um, thank you everyone so much for joining us. And thank you to Camila Bonifaz as well, who's the coordinator behind all of this uh, event. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, have a, a good uh, rest of the uh, of the night. Uh, Alexandra, I think it's past midnight. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, 2 a.m. Okay, well, thank you so much. Have